Welcome to the Invite Health Podcast, where our degreed healthcare professionals are excited to offer you the most important health and wellness information you need to make informed choices about your health. You can learn more about the products discussed in each of these episodes and all that Invite Health has to offer at www.invitehealth.com slash podcast. First time customers can use promo code podcast at checkout for an additional 15% off your first purchase. Let's get started. Most of us have probably been given a lot of wise wisdom from a family member somewhere along the way that has told us about the importance of having prunes and how beneficial that can be for healthy bowel function. Well, I want to talk about that specifically today, not prunes, but I want to talk about constipation because we know that constipation is a major problem in this country and it affects so many people. So I want to talk about kind of the pathophysiology behind chronic constipation along with different things that you can be doing to address this issue because this isn't something that's normal. We shouldn't accept constipation as a normal part of your life. And our diet plays a major role into this, which is why we go back to that family member that probably at one point in time told you, you should have some prunes every day. So there is certainly some truth to that. And we're going to get into that today on our episode. I am Amanda Williams, MD, MPH, and let's talk about chronic constipation. Now, before I decided to do this particular episode, I thought, you know what, let me look at the weekly flyers from Walgreens and CVS, because it always amazes me how dysfunctional we are as a society when it comes to digestive health. You can look through any weekly circular, any of the the weekly ads, and you see at least one to two pages that are fully dedicated to just how messed up our digestive system really is. When you look at these flyers, it is absolutely amazing. I mean, there's things that are targeting your acid reflux and your heartburn and your constipation and, you know, your diarrhea and all of the different things. So it's like, goodness, as a society, maybe we should probably start to look at what are we doing to ourselves and what can we do in terms of our dietary intake? So I thought it was interesting being that it's the holiday season. So usually these weekly ads are just packed with all the different gift ideas. But even in these times, we are still seeing a whole page that is dedicated to the problems that go along with bad diet and chronic constipation. So let's talk a little bit about the actual science behind constipation and why it's so prevalent. And it really is. And I always say, this is something that many people, they don't want to talk about it first and foremost, because it's an embarrassing subject. People don't usually, you know, bring it up as a topic like, hey, you know, I'm highly constipated. How about you? So I get that. I understand that this is one of those private matters when it comes to your personal health that people just don't really like to freely discuss. And then of course, you have the one relative that just loves to talk about it all the time. So you have the two ends of the spectrum. But when we look at chronic idiopathic constipation, what that actually is, is we are looking at an unsatisfactory system in terms of proper defecation. So yes, we have to use these terms and we have to talk about bowel movements and defecation, but we need to realize what is actually occurring in a physiological manner in the body. So we're talking about infrequent stools. Now, the reason why I bring this up and a lot of this information you can find even through the American Journal of Gastroenterology, which makes sense because this is kind of their, their wheelhouse, right? But we know that chronic idiopathic constipation affects upwards of 20% of the adults in the United States. So that's a huge amount of the population that is dealing with constipation. Now, most people, they're very private about this. Maybe they are running off to their Walgreens or their CVS and they're trying to get whatever they can that'll help with more frequent, healthier bowel movements. But we have to think, well, what is functionally going wrong within the body? 
So we have to first look at the diet. So we go back to the beginning and we talk about that relative that always says, hey, prunes are very good for you. Well, why is that? Because when we look at the fiber content, this is where we fall short, incredibly short as Americans. So we know that we should be getting roughly 30 grams of fiber every single day. And the average American struggles to even come close to getting 10 grams. So when we look at something like prunes, for example, a cup full of prunes can yield you 12, 15 grams of fiber. So yes, there is a lot of truth to the fact that prunes can be beneficial, but it's multifactorial. So it's not like I'm just going to have prunes every day and that's going to solve all of the issues. No, we have to look at a comprehensive way to address this problem. And so we have to recognize that it's all of the foods that we are eating. We have to make sure that we have proper hydration. We know that the majority of Americans walk around in a state of dehydration, which is not beneficial for your bowel movements. So we have to look at hydration. We have to look at consistent high fiber in our diet each and every single day. And when we're talking about that fiber, we want to be thinking the fiber that we're taking in from our foods. So those green leafy vegetables, all vegetables in general, when we look at fruits, we have to start to incorporate this. And I always default back and say, when they did the National Nutritional Survey, they recognize that over 75% of Americans do not get do not get the required amount of fruit per day, which is one to two cups. That's not a hard feat to achieve, but yet 75% of Americans cannot do that. And then we look at the even more alarming number when it comes to vegetable intake. We should be taking in two to three cups per day. And over 85% of Americans fall, fall short of that, which is really a major issue. So if our predominant source of fiber is coming from things like fruits and vegetable, and we are not getting it, then no wonder why 20% of the adult population in the United States suffers from chronic idiopathic constipation. So what can we do? Well, first, we have to adhere to a Mediterranean style diet, which is going to incorporate all of those key nutrients So you're going to get that broad spectrum of high fiber foods along with healthy fats, along with good protein. This is why the Mediterranean diet is so incredibly beneficial for the entire body, for every single system. So these are the things that we have to make sure that we adhere to. We have to make sure that we are staying hydrated and hydrated in the right way. We cannot look at diet soda and regular soda as a means for hydration. We have to put those sugary drinks off to the side and we need to replace that with things like water. It's a novel idea, but water is the body's best friend. So having water, now there's a lot of people that say, I just can't drink water. I don't like the taste of it. I mean, I've heard that I don't know how many times throughout the years. I don't like the taste of water. Well, water's not really supposed to have a taste to it. But there are ways that you can skirt around that. You can add in things like the green tea or the white tea TX. There's ways that you can get that liquid into your system and make sure that we have proper hydration. So let's think about other things that can actually lead to kind of a a predisposition to becoming constipated. Obviously, we know that there's a lot of pathogenesis to this, and it can be multifactorial. So diet is first and foremost. We know this, but we know that there can be other issues. We can look at the motility system within the intestines. Remember, we have through the stomach, and then we go into the small intestines. We have those finger-like projections that help with the absorption of our nutrients. Well, if those little microvilli have been you know, beat up through the years because of bad foods and bad bacteria, then we are not serving ourselves well, which is why we always talk about the microbiome. So looking at things like probiotics, that's why having fermented foods, for example, very beneficial because that microbiome really thrives on those types of foods. But we can also incorporate in a daily probiotic, such as probiotic HX, for example, which has been shown in human clinical trials to be incredibly supportive for those who deal with chronic constipation. So we put good, healthy bugs in. So we know that 
the motility will start to work better. So we have the absorption issue, but then we have to think about the actual peristalsis, that movement of everything throughout the intestines. So we know that, but we also know that there are behavioral issues. There are, you know, other biological issues. We can look at people who have chronic anxiety, um, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorders, depression. These are all things that can impact the motility in the proper functioning of our stool moving through. So we know that these things can certainly happen. We know that a sedentary lifestyle, which the majority of Americans happen to adhere to as a sedentary lifestyle, we know that this also will impact proper bowel function. So we have to think about this. We know that the overuse of things like laxatives, so so for someone who is chronically constipated, but yet they deal with it by just taking laxative after laxative, over time, that whole process kind of blows up in your face. So we know overuse of laxatives is a primary causative reason for chronic constipation. We know the things like stress, the lack of exercise, the poor dietary choices. We can look at metabolic disorders, endocrine disorders, such as hypothyroidism, for example. Many people who have even subclinical hypothyroidism will suffer with issues such as chronic constipation. We can certainly look at other factors, even medications. And we know that medications certainly can become very problematic. There's a lot of different medications out there that people are not even aware that they create a state of constipation. They're slowing everything down. And I mean, most people have heard that opioids do that, of course, because now they have a drug that targets your constipation brought on because of your opioids. So the key thing is opioids should be short-term use, not long-term, which is creating constipation, right? So we, we know that, but we have to look at other drugs that people may not be aware are actually creating a series of events that creates constipation. We can look at certain high blood pressure medications. We know that the calcium channel blockers can leave people to be more prone to the development of constipation. We can certainly look at certain antidepressants, the tricyclic antidepressants in particular. We know certainly can play a role into the development of chronic constipation. We know that many of the antipsychotic medications, even NSAIDs, so chronic use of pain reliever, over-the-counter pain relievers, can actually lead you down the path to chronic constipation. And diuretics, so oftentimes when someone has high blood pressure, they will also be given a diuretic in conjunction. So they may be on a beta blocker plus hydrochlorothiazide, for example. We know that the diuretics can lead to, because what is it doing? It's removing that extra fluid. Well, we also need fluid for that proper movement of the stool. So we have all of these different things that we know can create an environment where we have a problem with constipation, which is why we go back to that statistic of 20% of the adult population in the United States can suffer from this. So let's cut to the chase and talk about what we can do. So first and foremost, we know diet is the predominant thing we need to work on. So diet and adequate fluid intake and the right fluids. So not those sugary drinks. That's not going to be helpful. We also know that we have to make sure that we have magnesium. And so I advise magnesium citrate. Reason why is because the intestinal absorption of magnesium when it's bound to citrate works really well in terms of all of the proper functionality within the intestine. So we want to have that relaxation of the smooth muscle so we have better movement throughout the intestines. So magnesium citrate. How much should you take? Well, I always say it's based on your bowel tolerance. If you take too much magnesium citrate, you will know because you'll be running off to the bathroom with more more than likely loose stools. So with magnesium citrate, generally you start off with a low, slow dose and you build yourself up into a point that your body is accepting of that. So for some people, that may be 200 milligrams per day. For others, it may be 1,000 milligrams per day. So you really have to personalize that to what your specific needs are. But we can also look 
as I mentioned, probiotic, making sure that that microbial environment is able to thrive and survive. We don't want bad bugs chasing out our good bugs, creating a problem with proper absorption of those nutrients. So probiotic, HX, one capsule of that. I advise taking that at night because in the evening, our intestines are usually in a more relaxed state. We want to make sure that those good, healthy bacteria can get in and help to recolonize. So probiotic HX, magnesium, but we can also look at other nutrients. So we have our food changes, we have magnesium, we have probiotic, but we also can look at colon HX. Now this is a really nice blend of psyllium fiber. We know psyllium is the primary fiber that we look at when we think about GI health. And the reason why is because psyllium helps in terms of the production of a very beneficial short chain fatty acid, which is known as butyrate. And what we know about butyrate is that butyrate has vital anti-inflammatory properties, which is a very good thing. So the more butyrate that we can build up, the less inflamed the actual intestines will be. And this is key because we know chronic inflammation is the backbone to all of the issues going on. So psyllium fiber is the primary thing that is in colon HX, but it is also blended with bentonite clay, which is really quite cool. So the bentonite clay works in a way in terms of detoxification. So it's helping to bind on to things that we really just don't want lingering about our intestines. So by having this blend of the power of psyllium fiber, which is enhancing our butyrate production, which helps with easing inflammation, we also have this natural bentonite clay that helps with the natural detoxification. So colon HX, this is something, it's a powder, and I advise taking that at night, one scoop in with a full glass of water, This is a really great way to provide the intestines with this really powerful and healthy fiber, the psyllium, along with the power for detoxification. So we know that detoxification is one of the things that our body goes through each and every single day, metabolic detoxification. So by enhancing that with the bentonite clay really allows for a healthy intestinal environment. And at the end of the day, that's what we are trying to achieve. We are trying to make sure that we don't fall into that category where we are dealing with this incomplete process that should be very normal. And with so many people that are dealing with this, we know that because of this high prevalence, this leads to many other issues in terms of our overall health. We need to make sure that we are removing those toxins. And if we are chronically constipated, then we can get to a point where we are having more toxins circulating the body than we like to have. So when it comes to chronic constipation, there are many things that we can be doing. We have to focus on the foods, focus on the fluids, and make sure that we have magnesium, probiotic, and good healthy fiber such as psyllium like you would find in the colon HX that helps to optimize our overall intestinal health. So that is all that I have for you for today. And I want to thank you so much for tuning in to the Invite Health Podcast. Remember, you can find all of our episodes for free wherever you listen to podcasts or by visiting invitehealth.com slash podcast. Now do make sure that you subscribe and you leave us a review and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Invite Health. And we will see you next time for another episode of the Invite Health Podcast.